the gathering of the Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo, Illinois, God's love and the Y temples have become such a center point of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today. These are all topics we'll be discussing in today's episode of the Hope in Christ podcast. I'm glad you tuned in. Hi everyone, welcome to the Hope in Christ podcast, a weekly conversation following the Come Follow Me curriculum of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we dive deeper into the scriptures and use them as a launching pad for relevant conversations to help us all live Christ's gospel, survive living in the last days, rediscover how we fit into God's plan, and increase our hope and faith in Jesus Christ as we work to prepare the world for His return. I'm so glad you're listening and sincerely hope you enjoy the show. It's so great to be back with you again in another relevant conversation about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have been overwhelmed this week when I think about our Heavenly Father's love. I have felt His love directly through the Holy Ghost, and I've also felt His love through some very kind and compassionate messages from many of you listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you for your faith, your prayers of faith on my behalf. Uh, I know I shared some personal experiences in our last episode, and though I wasn't doing so to to solicit messages or or sympathy, um, I definitely received some wonderful messages from some of you, and I thank you so much for for your goodness and for uh, your discipleship and and trying to be like the Savior. And I'm glad that you find um, joy and interest in this podcast, and I hope it continues to invite the Spirit into your life. So today's episode, it takes us to the city of Nauvoo. As you know, uh, Joseph Smith and others who were in Liberty Jail did escape And they did that around April 6th of 1839. After five months in Liberty Jail, they were assisted in their escape by one of the guards and ended up making their way up to Quincy, Illinois, where many of the saints were gathering. And as refugees, they had found a loving people who were accepting them and taking them in. And uh, we really just owe a lot in the church to those of Quincy, Illinois, uh, back in the year of 1839. Well, Eventually, the Saints purchased uh, the city of Commerce, Illinois, in Hancock County, and they also purchased a lot of tracts of land across the Mississippi River in Iowa. And they started to establish a city called Nauvoo. This would become a place where the Saints would have legal authority to protect their free exercise of religion. They had their own legislature, they established their own laws, they had their own militia. They were able to secure for themselves a very secure place for some years where they could build up the kingdom of God and establish a uh, temple and uh, and continue to receive revelations from the Lord as he sought to restore the gospel of Jesus Christ to the earth in the fullness of times, this last dispensation. Now, an announcement to build a temple in Nauvoo came in about August of 1840. And though construction on that temple wouldn't begin until the beginning of 1841. Now, during the fall of 1840, Joseph Smith introduced the subject of baptisms for the dead. And that will be a main topic of our next episode. And that announcement of baptisms for the dead consequently found the saints performing these baptisms for the dead in the Mississippi River. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that in later on in this episode. In December of 1840, the saints obtained the charter for the city of Nauvoo and a charter for the university of the city of Nauvoo. This university would become a model for much of what the church would do for education for many, many, many years. In fact, even today, uh, much of the model of the church via education came from that establishment of the university in the city of Nauvoo. Now, in the context of these efforts to establish a new city for the saints on the banks of the Mississippi, the first presidency issued what would be the first proclamation that would be formally issued by the church. And it was done on January 15th, 1841. This is four days before section 124 was revealed. And it was a proclamation directed to the saints scattered abroad. So it wasn't a proclamation to the world as much as it was a proclamation to the members of the church throughout the world. And this was the first of 
right up till now, we've had six proclamations. You know, the last one was the proclamation that came out in April 2020, the proclamation on the restoration, and then the fifth one was the proclamation on the family, and then there were four others uh, before that. This was the first. Now, in that proclamation to the saints scattered abroad, it says, I'm just going to quote a little bit of this, and it's because of how relevant it is today. It said, the temple of the Lord is in progress of erection here, where the saints will come to worship the God of, our, of their fathers, according to the order of his house and the powers of the holy priesthood, and will be so constructed as to enable all the functions of the priesthood to be duly exercised, and where instructions from the Most High will be received, and from this place go forth to distant lands." So talking about the temple, there's a focus on how the temple in Nauvoo is going to reveal the functions of the priesthood and instruction from the Most High. It also said this in that proclamation, the university of the city of Nauvoo will enable us to teach our children wisdom, to instruct them in all knowledge and learning, in the arts, sciences, and learned professions. We hope to make this institution one of the great lights of the world, and by and through it, to diffuse that kind of knowledge which will be of practical utility and for the public good and also for private and individual happiness. If you would like to know a little bit more about the history of church education and what the church has done, beginning with the University of the City of Nauvoo and all the way up till now with BYU, BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, the Enzyme College, and BYU Pathway Worldwide, taking education to the entire world, I could give you a link. In fact, I might include it in the notes to this. I wrote a, my master thesis was written on the history and creation of BYU Pathway Worldwide. And I wrote another article that's much shorter than the thesis that was published in the Religious Educator magazine for, by BYU. And it's about how the church has taken education to the world, starting with Nauvoo and all the way till today with BYU Pathway Worldwide. I'll include that link in the notes if you'd like to, to read that. Um, I think it's good, but I wrote it, so I'm kind of biased. Only four days after that proclamation was released, Joseph Smith received a revelation on January 19, 1841, identifying Nauvoo as a temple city and a new gathering place, giving instructions to church leaders and establishing the organization of the church in Nauvoo. And that revelation is recorded now in section 124 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And that revelation was seen by many of the saints in Joseph Smith's day as the Nauvoo revelation. It was as nearly close to an outline of the purpose of the church in Nauvoo as you could possibly get. After the personal apostasy and dissension of some of the church leaders, the Lord revealed in this section of the Doctrine and Covenants who would comprise the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He also called for the establishment of a new stake of Zion in Nauvoo with respective leaders for that stake. Now, with this stake established, the Lord revealed that it was now time to send forth another proclamation. This one would be sent to the kings and rulers of the world. So this is the first proclamation to the world, the second proclamation formally issued by the church. And it wasn't actually issued until 1845, a year after Joseph Smith was martyred, and it was drafted by Parley P. Pratt. In verse 5 of section 124, we read this in verses 5 through 7. For this proclamation shall be given you by the Holy Ghost to know my will concerning those kings and authorities, even what shall befall them in a time to come. For behold, I am about to call upon them to give heed to the light and glory of Zion, for the set time has come to favor her. Call ye therefore upon them with loud proclamation and with your testimony, fearing them not, for they are as grass and all their glory is the flower thereof which soon falleth that they may be left also without excuse. So here are some excerpts. I'm going to read this because it's so relevant to our day today. What Elder Pratt does as he issues this proclamation from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles to the world is he starts to talk a little bit about the purpose of the church and really identifying the church as the kingdom of God on the earth and just cluing the world into what's going on in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and helping them see that what will happen through the course of the future in fulfilling biblical prophecy and welcoming the second coming of the Lord and actually beginning the the reign of the millennium. So here are some excerpts. 
It said, We further testify that the Lord has appointed a holy city and temple to be built on this continent for the endowment and ordinances pertaining to the priesthood and for the Gentiles and the remnant of Israel to resort unto in order to worship the Lord and to be taught in His ways and walk in His paths. In short, to finish their preparations for the coming of the Lord. And we further testify that the Jews among all nations are hereby commanded in the name of the Messiah to prepare to return to Jerusalem in Palestine and to rebuild that city and temple unto the Lord. He spoke more of the work of the restoration of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and gathering all Gentiles into the same covenant and organization, instructing them in preparation for their own individual sanctification and spiritual preparation, that the whole church of the saints, both Gentile, Jew, and Israel, may be prepared as a bride for the coming of the Lord. Now, we know he's the bridegroom, the church is the bride, and Elder Pratt and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in this proclamation are calling for the world to prepare themselves, to join in the same organization and the same covenants with God's people to be that bride ready for the coming of the bridegroom. In essence, stating, look, guys, We're done with the apostasy. The dark ages are over. If you have any interest in understanding why the Industrial Revolution and the Renaissance and Romanticism and all the things that have been going on the last few hundred years and why everything's starting to pick up now, if you want to know why that's happening, if you want to know what God is doing on the earth today and why that's all taking place, then come to Nauvoo. Come and understand what God is doing on this earth, in this dispensation, to gather all things together in one in Christ and to prepare for his return. It's an exciting proclamation to read. He then poses that in this proclamation questions to kings, rulers, presidents, governors, judges, legislatures, nobles, lords, and rich men of the earth, asking them, will you leave us alone to struggle through this work? Or will you join us in covering the earth with light, knowledge, truth, union, peace, and love, and usher in the great millennium? Know assuredly that whether you come to the help of the saints in this great work, or whether you make light of this message and withhold your aid and cooperation, it is all the same as to the success and final triumph of the work. For it is the work of the great God for which his word and oath has been pledged from before the foundation of the world. And that is as true today as it was then. Whether or not you and I decide to be part of his work will not change what's going to take place. He will triumph, and his team will win. The proclamation then goes on. You cannot therefore stand as idle and disinterested spectators of the scenes and events which are calculated in their very nature to reduce all nations and creeds to one political and religious standard, and thus put an end to Babel forms and names and to strife and war. You will therefore either be led by the good spirit to take a lively interest with the saints of the Most High and the covenant people of the Lord, or on the other hand, you'll become their enemy and oppose them by every means in your power. To such an extreme will this great division finally extend that the nations of the old world will combine to oppose these things by military force. So now he's referring to the future, what will happen as the second coming approaches. They will send a great army to Palestine against the Jews, and they'll besiege their city and will reduce the inhabitants of Jerusalem to the greatest extreme of distress and misery. This is talking about the future. He's foretelling how this will end. Then will commence a struggle in which the fate of nations and empires will be suspended on a single battle. In this battle, the governors and people of Judah distinguish themselves for their bravery and warlike achievements. The weak among them will be like David, and the strong among them will be like God or like the angel of the Lord. In that day, the Lord will pour upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon the Messiah whom they've pierced, for lo, he will descend from heaven as the defender of the Jews and to complete their victory. His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which shall cleave in sunder at his presence and remove one half to the north and one other to the south, thus forming a great valley where the mountain now stands. The earth will quake around him while storm and tempest Hail and plague are mingled with the clash of arms, the roar of artillery, the shouts of victory, and the groans of the wounded and dying. In that day, 
all who were in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem, shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth should be gathered together against it. This signal victory on the part of the Jews, so unlooked for by the nations, and attended with the personal advent of the Messiah, and the accompanying events will change the whole order of things in regard to political and religious organization and government. These events will take place. They're political in nature. Be careful who you vote for. Be careful you know what the issues are. Be careful you know where they stand when it comes to Israel and defending the people of Israel today. Uh, In this proclamation, he continues and invites all to unite in ringing in the latter-day glory, that knowledge, truth, light, love, peace, union, honor, glory, and power may fill the earth with eternal life and joy. That death, bondage, oppression, wars, mourning, sorrow, and pain may be done away forever, and all tears be wiped from every eye. In fulfillment of the work assigned them, let the saints throughout the world and all others who feel an interest in the work of of God forward their gifts, tithes, and offerings for the building of the temple of the Lord, which is now in progress in the city of Nauvoo, in the state of Illinois. This is a remarkable proclamation. I invite you to go and look them up on the internet and find these proclamations and study them. They're all very relevant to the day in which they were issued. I'm excited that one of the very last lessons of the Come Follow Me curriculum this year is to study together the proclamation to the world called the family. And I know that as in the appendix of the manual for this year, Uh, We've included the proclamation that was issued in April 2020, but it's not on the actual curriculum. So I'm hoping to maybe get some time to throw that in there as well and study that together in an episode as well. So look forward to those. It's exciting. We live in an exciting time. Now, the next topic in our conversation today is the love of God. Now, if you want to learn more about this topic, definitely go back and listen to Elder D. Todd Christofferson's talk in conference in October of 2021. Also, if you'd like to listen to another podcast episode, uh, episode 29 of the Hope in Christ podcast called, quote, Love versus God's Love is another really relevant uh, conversation about God's love and the difference between what the world thinks is God's love versus what God's love really is. So in section 124, we address this just a little bit because the Lord reveals to us a little bit about his love. In verse 15, speaking of Hiram Smith, he said, I, the Lord, love him because of the integrity of his heart and because he loveth that which is right before me. And in verse 20, speaking of George Miller, he said, For the love which he has to my testimony, I, the Lord, love him. These are reminders that though God's love is infinite, yes, and it's perfect, yes, and it's always there for us, yes, it is also a love that increases with our faithfulness and increases as we in return love him. In October 2021, this last month, Elder Christofferson said, The love of the Father and the Son is freely given, but also includes hopes and expectations. Again, quoting President Nelson, God's laws are motivated entirely by his infinite love for us and his desire for us to become all we can become. Because they love you, Elder Christofferson continued, they do not want to leave you just as you are. Because they love you, they want you to have joy and success. Because they love you, they want you to repent. Because that is the path to happiness. But it's your choice. They honor your agency. You must choose to love them, to serve them, to keep their commandments. Then they can more abundantly bless you as well as love you. The Lord reminds us in verse 87 of section 124 that if we love him, we're to keep his commandments, which will bring about greater blessings for us. Now, God's blessings are a manifestation of his love, and he teaches us over and over and over again in the scriptures that greater blessings can come when we obey him. Elder Christofferson continued, in acknowledging that God loves us perfectly, we might each ask, How well do I love God? Can he rely on my love? 
as I rely on His? Would it not be a worthy aspiration to live so that God can love us, not just in spite of our failings, but also because of what we're becoming? Oh, that He could say of you and me, as He said of Hiram Smith, for example, I the Lord love him because of the integrity of his heart. Let us remember John's kind admonition, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. That's all we'll say about God's love. Again, if you want to hear more, definitely listen to Elder Christofferson's talk. Elder Holland spoke about it. Sister Porter spoke about it. It was mentioned as a major theme in conference this last month. And also, again, episode number 29, Love versus God's Love of this podcast. Moving to another conversation. In this revelation, in section 124, the saints were commanded to build the Nauvoo Temple and the Nauvoo House. Now, the Nauvoo House was a hotel of sorts. It was to be a place where Joseph and his family would live, but it would also be a place where people traveling from afar could come and stay while they ponder on the word of the Lord. So they could come and get a taste of the gospel. You know, this proclamation was to go throughout the world and inform people of what's happening in Nauvoo, what's taking place within the church. And they were invited to come and taste of it for themselves and then take it back to their homelands. This Nauvoo house would be comparable to what we called Hotel Utah, which is now called the, the Joseph Smith Memorial Building in downtown Salt Lake City. Hotel Utah was built much for the same purpose. It was right next to the temple, and it was built to welcome people and dignitaries from all over the world, where they could stay in Salt Lake City and see what God was doing with his covenant people and preparing the earth for his return. Now, the Nauvoo house was built also to house Joseph Smith, the prophet, and his family. When they built Hotel Utah, that wasn't a place where the prophet lived, but it did eventually become the place where a couple presidents of the church did live later in the 20th century. In this revelation, they were also commanded to build a temple in Nauvoo that would have a baptismal font. In verse 29, the Lord said, For a baptismal font there is not upon the earth, that they, my saints, may be baptized for those who are dead. For this ordinance belongeth to my house, and cannot be acceptable to me only in the days of your poverty, wherein you're not able to build a house unto me. So remember, a few months before this revelation was given, Joseph had revealed to the saints this subject of baptisms for the dead. They'd begun to do these baptisms in the Mississippi River. Because of their poverty, they didn't have a place to go to do these inside of a temple. They didn't have a temple at this time. And the Lord said, for now, I'll give you a, a certain amount of time that it's okay to do these in the Mississippi River. But once that time is over, once I've allowed you and, and facilitated the building and, and the building up of a temple, of, a, of my house, that ordinance, an ordinance of my house, must be done in my house to be acceptable to me. Because in verse 30, it says, for this ordinance belongeth to my house and cannot be acceptable to me in the river only in the days of your poverty. In verse 31, But I command you all ye my saints to build a house unto me, and I grant unto you a sufficient time to build a house unto me, and during this time your baptisms shall be acceptable unto me. Throughout this section, I invite you in your study to focus on some of the things the Lord says that identify the purpose for temples. I'll give you a few that I noticed. He mentions that it's for the fullness of the priesthood. That's a great study. Go, go study what is the fullness of the priesthood. Another reason for temples is that therein are the keys of the holy priesthood ordained. Priesthood keys. Another great study when you think about the temple. Now, specifically about temple work. Another reason he gave was to crown us with honor, immortality, and eternal life. The purpose of the temple is so that the ordinances of the Lord can be revealed, he said. That this is the order of God. The ordinances comes from the word order. The order of God can be revealed. His order, his way, the mysteries and things of God. And they're revealed in the temple through revelation. In verse 41, the Lord said, Things which have been kept hid from the, for the foundations of the world things that pertain to the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's our day. That's your day, my day. That's today. Things that pertain to our day. 
that have been hid from the foundation of the world. They're being revealed in temples through ordinances and through revelation. Joseph Smith once said, and this is in the history of the church, in volume 5, pages 1 and 2, he said, I spent the day in the upper part of the store, that is, in my private office, in council with General James Adams of Springfield, Patriarch Hiram Smith, Bishops Newell K. Whitney and George Miller, and President Brigham Young and Elders Heber C. Kimball and Willard Richards. I instructed them in the principles and order of the priesthood, attending to washings, anointings, endowments, and the communication of keys pertaining to the Aaronic priesthood, and so on to the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, setting forth the order pertaining to the Ancient of Days, that's Adam, and all those plans and principles by which anyone is enabled to secure the fullness of those blessings which have been prepared for the Church of the Firstborn and come up and abide in the presence of the Elohim in the eternal worlds. In this council was instituted the ancient order of things for the first time in these last days, and the communications I made to this council were of things spiritual, and to be received only by the spiritual minded. And there was nothing made known to these men but what will be made known to all the saints of the last days, so soon as they're prepared to receive and a proper place is prepared to communicate them, even to the weakest of the saints. Therefore, let the saints be diligent in building the temple and all houses which they have been or shall hereafter be commanded of God to build, and wait their time with patience in all meekness, faith, perseverance unto the end, knowing assuredly that all these things referred to in this council are always governed by the principle of revelation. That's a long quote, but I'd like to just dissect just a part of it with you. He said that all the things that are necessary for anyone to receive the fullness of the blessings that are prepared for the church of the firstborn were revealed in that council and will be revealed in the temple. Now, the church of the firstborn, if you think about in the Book of Mormon, we hear about the church of Christ. You have the church, the great and abominable church, and the church of Christ. Well, in that sense, the church of Christ includes anyone who has faith in Jesus Christ, anyone who has faith in God, any good god fearing people. And this could include other faiths, such as the Muslim faith, who call him Allah, and we call him Elohim. It's the same name, different language, but uh, these are good god fearing people, are the Church of Christ. Then you have, within that circle of people who belong to the Church of Christ, you have another circle, an inner circle, Some of those people in the Church of Christ would also belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is baptism by His authority into His actual organization on the earth. And then within that circle, you have another inner circle called the Church of the Firstborn. Not every member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be a member of the Church of the Firstborn but only members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be members of the Church of the Firstborn because it fits within the the circle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You find the Church of the Firstborn, which are those who receive exaltation. We read that in the Doctrine and Covenants section 76. These are those of the Church of the Firstborn. These are those who have been begotten sons and daughters of Christ, who become joint heirs with him. This, these are great conversations. You'll find uh, bits and pieces of this conversation spattered throughout our episodes of this podcast, and we'll definitely get more into them when we get to the New Testament. Another thing he mentioned in this quote is that all of this is governed by the principle of revelation. Remember, when you're in the temple, it's not just what you do that's important, but it's what you hear. It's what you hear said, spoken verbally, and what you hear that's not spoken verbally. What the Lord speaks to your mind. Remember, the symbols of the temple are, are there to teach us at different stages of our life, and they can teach us different things at different stages. So pay close attention to that spirit of revelation. Now let's talk for a second about temples. Now you might have noticed that temples are becoming quite the center point of the church today. Now, they've always been the center of the church, but it's more noticeable today where we have an expansion of temple construction that is unprecedented in the history of the world. 
we have temples being built all over in the most remote places where relatively few members live. The reason for this is absolutely connected to the focus of the church. Elder David A. Bednar, only a couple of days ago, I'm talking this week, in a leadership meeting with members of the Abu Dhabi stake in Dubai, he said this, the focus of everything we do in this church is helping people to become yoked to and with the Savior through the covenants and ordinances of His restored gospel. Period. Exclamation point. End of sentence. That's it. That's all we do. That's the end of Elder Bednar's quote. President Russell M. Nelson also said, this is April 2001, the temple is the house of the Lord. The basis for every temple ordinance and covenant, the heart of the plan of salvation, is the atonement of Jesus Christ. Every activity, every lesson, all we do in the church, point to the Lord and his holy house. Our efforts to proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, and redeem the dead all lead to the temple. Each holy temple stands as a symbol of our membership in the church, as a sign of our faith in life after death, and as a sacred step toward eternal glory for us and for our families. Now, I remember a few years ago, our board kept splitting, and we found ourselves without a place to attend church inside of our stake boundaries. There were too many wards in our stake to fit our ward into any of the meeting houses. So we found ourselves driving in our ward, in, our, in my neighborhood, we drove through the boundaries of three stakes, through our entire stake boundary from one side to the other, and through two more stakes to the edge of another stake to get to a meeting house where we could attend church. Now, we weren't building a lot of churches at the time, and we still aren't building a lot of churches, relatively speaking. Speaking of this idea of, of not building meeting houses and building so many more temples, I once heard President Nelson say, we are commanded to build temples. Meeting houses are a luxury. Now, when you think about that, we know in the, in, these, in the last year and a half, your two years, we know that you can meet in a lot of different ways and take the sacrament. We can meet virtually and partake of the sacrament uh, in our homes. We can meet just as families and partake of the sacrament in our homes. Members throughout the world who don't have meeting houses meet in rented facilities or even homes of members for their sacrament meetings. You can take the sacrament anywhere in the earth where the keys of the priesthood authorize that sacrament to be administered. But temple ordinances, as the Lord said in this section of Baptisms for the Dead, temple ordinances belong in His house. So as President Nelson had said, we're commanded to build temples. Meeting houses are a luxury. It's something that just, it's nice to have. Um, But we don't need them. We need temples. In uh, Joseph, President Joseph Smith said, what was the object of the gathering of the people of God in any age of the world? The main object was to build unto the Lord a house whereby he could reveal unto his people the ordinances of his house and the glories of his kingdom and teach the people the way of salvation. For there are certain ordinances and principles that when they're taught and practiced must be done in a place or house built for that purpose. He also said the church is not fully organized in its proper order and cannot be until the temple is completed where places will be provided for the administration of the ordinances of the priesthood. He went on to say at another time, that they may build a house which shall be accepted by the Almighty and in which his power and glory shall be manifested. Let those who can freely make a sacrifice of their time, their talents, and their property unite with us in this great work of the last days and share in the tribulation that they may ultimately share in the glory and triumph. That kind of echoes that proclamation that we read through earlier. And in June 2017, President M. Russell Ballard said, we're building these temples, not only for us in this moment of our history, but we're building temples which will be used during the millennium, when this great work will be carried on in the house of the Lord under the direction and supervision of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's a quote from the Church News from June 8th, 2017. Today we've discussed the importance of having a temple in order to fulfill the purpose of the church. If you'd like to understand a little bit more about what takes place in temples, definitely check out episodes 24, Accessing the Power of God, 26, Sanctify Yourselves, and 33, 
temples and how they prepare us for the second coming. I don't want to repeat everything I said in those episodes, so just go back and listen to some of those again. Again, it's uh, episode 24, Accessing the Power of God, 26, Sanctify Yourselves, and 33, Temples and How They Prepare Us for the Second Coming. Those are all episodes that focus on sections of the Doctrine and Covenants where we learn of the doctrine behind the temple, sections 84, 88, and 109. It has been great to be with you again. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm excited to talk to you next week as we dive into the doctrine of baptisms for the dead and doing temple work and why it's so important to get temple work done as we work to prepare the earth for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I love you all and have an excellent week. Until next time. Thanks for listening in today and for taking the time to subscribe and share this message with people you love. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. You can also find this podcast on YouTube at Hope in Christ, a Come Follow Me podcast. Or connect with me on Instagram at Bro Ben Peterson. And remember until our next conversation, there is always hope in Christ.